Okay, well, uh, as, as I mentioned, we don't have an, a formal agenda for this meeting. So um, in the chat, I see Daniel asking about chatting, to, uh, chatting on records and tuples. And I have my outstanding item for reviewing TC39 proposals in general that are relevant to this group. Um, do we have any other suggestions for our agenda? I'd really like to hear about register, uh, uh, registers, <laughs> records, and tools. Um, I, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about what happened last week on the meeting uh, about security. I, I, I didn't get a chance to look at the notes. I don't know if there's a recording of that. Just, just to know what, what the outcome of that was. There should be a recording. There, there are minutes taken. I can send you a link to the to the notes. I guess they'll be posted online soon. Let me, let me find it. Uh, but my, my understanding of the outcome was more or less that, um, you know, these multiple positions were articulated with browsers articulating this position that it's important to not have too many hooks into things because it can make it hard to implement things correctly and without sort of correctness or buffer overflow kind of that class of security problems and other people more with ideas from from this group were were saying you can also build security through mechanisms discussed here and the agreement was to convene a security tg to continue the discussion i think a bunch more people were there so does anybody have more to add um i was there i attended this with mark miller um, and even one of the, the um, outcomes, yes, it, it is about possibly uh, creating a security task group within TC39 because um, there are probably things that are like too many things that are within the scope of SES and there are things that might be not only in the scope of SES. So, uh, and there's a discussion on the reflector right now about creating a task group to discuss security. And there's definitely interest, especially from Mark Miller, to uh, use this task group or consider this task group to discuss SES or I think, the topics that we usually discuss here. I think it would be best to maintain uh, this call is separate from the security call because this call is opinionated towards focusing on this um, object capability approach to security and I you know and I find it really useful to have discussions in that frame and I think the security TG will start with more basic questions um, um, you talked about priority you know explicitly putting pitting the implementation correctness against the, the these feature requests Yes, and, and for that, I think we should have a, 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 like a new discussion about this task group creation, et cetera, when we also have Mark Miller uh, present here because it's important that like we have Mark Miller uh, and like feedbacks on, on that, like what he wants for his understanding over that like task group. Even if uh, we are considering uh, a task group, a formal task group for SES as well. Uh, unfortunately, there were uh, there were no uh, time available to discuss this with Mark. I was expecting to see Mark today here. My bad. Um, but we we probably should have Mar Mark on board of this discussion too. Oh yeah, I didn't notice he was missing. Yeah, I agreed. Mark Mark is. Uh deep in some crunch mode coding right now. The, uh, yeah, the, the impression that I got was that uh, Mark was open to dissolving this meeting in favor of creating the task group in order to, uh, because I think that the intention is that everybody who is here who would want to be in that meeting uh, in, in the task group and that uh, having another meeting every, uh, uh, at, at whatever interval would probably be uh, onerous.
for the participants. But uh, again, I agree, we should uh, you know, have this conversation when Mark's present so he can ref uh, share his opinion. Yeah, Mark made it clear that he wanted to do that and the browsers made it clear they didn't want that meeting to be about SES topic or dominated by SES topics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Uh, Daniel, would you like to take it away with uh, I, I, I mean, Chip, I believe you also expressed an interest in records and tuples. Yeah, I don't have any particular uh, opinions to express here other than I'm kind of generally in favor of the whole idea. Uh, I, but I'm curious what the kind of state of, of thought is and, you know, it's just a topic of interest to me. Okay, should I start or? Yeah, that's your signal. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's really too bad that Mark isn't here. But the thing I wanted to talk about was sort of to follow up on last time I came in, we talked about value types, but specifically about records and tuples to start. Uh, the current proposal is that they're primitives and primitives have wrappers. So uh, wrappers have identity. They're kind of you kind of want to optimize out their existence in as many cases as possible and strict mode helps that but only some of the time um i was wondering if we should make records and doubles objects but say that they're objects without identity that they're objects that compare by value that only have other things without identity but that they're still considered objects so i wrote a i wrote a gist about this i pasted in the chat we all, uh, I'll try to uh, walk through this, I guess. So, uh, yeah, with, with normal objects, they have uh, their triple equals or object is compare their identity. And, um, but the idea is that with records and tuples, they would be objects, so they wouldn't have wrappers. They would be objects directly, and the comparison would be by their, by their contents, and that you can't observe their identity. They're always frozen. You can't, one difference between frozen objects is you can't add private fields to them, and they also won't have mutable internal slots. Um, and you can't use them in weak maps and things like that. So, so Daniel, uh, a quick question about this. Um, what, what is the reason for this to, 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 to have them as objects rather than a new primitive? So the first reason is uh, the wrappers, the wrapper semantics are kind of uh, unhelpful. The, you know, you want to avoid creating the wrappers. We have to worry about what are the semantics when you have a wrapper? How does that differ from the underlying record? Like they'll have a different identity. But uh, it really, uh, I mean, I'll explain in this as we go down the document. So equality, I'm imagining that we would define equality just the same way. Um, and so wrappers would, yeah, one, one detail is the objects are frozen, where there was this whole question about whether the wrappers are frozen or not. Another thing is that wrappers normally have identity, so equality on them is suddenly broken. Another one is about uh, kind of implementation and specification complexity, that you want to avoid the creation of wrappers. Um, overall, it seems like the, the specification and implementation will be simplified. So the first so the, the two big things that I think this would enable is record proxies and, and box. So record proxies, it would be like a proxy that has a target and a handler, except they would be compared by value. You would compare, you would say that they're equal if the target and the handler are equal. I guess this should be object that is to be precise. Um, but 
if we had records compared by value, wouldn't this help membrane systems? Then you wouldn't need a weak map to cache the the proxy object. You would just make a new record proxy. Because you don't if you don't need any particular state in the membrane for the for the object that you're wrapping. So just to clarify about proxy.record, uh, this would be similar to if I'm guessing the target has to be a record in this. Um, uh, well, modulo the box thing that I'll explain next. OK, then I'll wait. Um, I have a question. Why proxy uh, record? Uh, the, the record proxies are, uh, is this only available if we have records and tuples as objects? Uh, Maybe there's a way to separate this out, but to me, this makes sense if they're objects as records and tuples. Where right now a proxy over a record and tuple, if they're primitives, doesn't really make sense because you don't have a target that's a that's a primitive. Did you so I'm elaborate? Sorry. You're, 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 I'm getting very confused. It's, it's, uh, I was I wasn't aware of this change uh, last time that I look at it was it's wasn't not, really. I'm proposing it to you for the first time. I haven't put it on the on the repo yet. It's okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Okay. I was like, okay, well, this is all new. So I I still haven't get my head around the fact that they will be objects um, or they could be objects rather than primitive values. When we talk about primitive values, we're saying, well, they're pretty much the same as a symbols and anything else so the identity across realms and across membranes the identity on both sides is the same so we don't really worry about being proxified or any of that um yeah now you make them objects then it, it makes it a, a little more complicated for so it seems that they being a primitive is easier for membranes because then the membrane doesn't do anything um but making it an object well, it makes it a lot more difficult for a proxy on itself, like uh, it, because it is an object. I suspect that the prototype of the, that object is null. That's my yeah, guess. I want to finish the presentation before we go through these questions because it's further right, down. Okay, okay. Got, got, got. Uh, so got one big benefit, it, you know, the reason that I started thinking about this is because the XS people, uh, we have an email thread with them, and they were saying, "Hey, this doesn't." This doesn't seem so great for our users because it doesn't fit in so well with the read-only collections proposal. And I kind of realized they're right. You can't point to a read-only collection from a record or tuple except with symbols as weak map keys. And um, it sort of splits the universe. Or another example of this is temporal. You kind of want to be able to point to a temporal object from a record or tuple. Um, you want to have a more general notion of what's uh, what doesn't have identity. So you kind of want to be able to make new things that don't have identity. And I think it would be a lot simpler to do that if they're objects than if they're only primitive types. So once we can do a proxy over a record or tuple, we can have box and it can be totally membrane safe. We can have box would be this built-in class that makes objects without identity that allows this deref method. And uh, it wouldn't be that it, it's based on the realm. It would really be that the deref method is based on the getting the thing out of the um, out of the box. It could be a, a cross realm internal slot. the 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 reason it's okay is because we can have these proxy records, these record proxies, and um, so records and tuples could point to mutable objects. Could point to objects with identity. You know, the only thing is we would still ask people to put things in a box before putting in a record and tuple so that um, by default, you have deep immutability. You have to call out to a specific escape hatch to violate that. And then I had some ideas about classes. So in particular, uh, once we have box, we could let people set the prototype of their records. Why not? I mean, one thing we were saying is that prototype property access would never work for string valued properties. But 
uh, maybe we should just allow that because then we could allow methods or we could even allow record classes. Uh, is, that, is that example, is that a new box or underscore underscore proto just box as a call a fun function that you call in there? I mean, that's like, oh yeah, that should say new box. Yeah, right. okay, new box. So you're saying you set it to a object that happens to be a, a box of, I'm still confused about what, what this give you. Uh, what's the confusion? I mean, the, the, the benefit is now we have box. Like this was a huge cost of records and tuples. It was everybody's number one complaint that symbols as weak map keys was not ergonomic enough that you really want to be able to have read-only collections or temporal objects directly in records and tuples. And so now we would have two ways, both they could be, on one hand, they could be other objects without identity, and it's easier to add another kind of object without identity than another primitive. And on the other hand, you have this box general purpose escape hatch, and it's safe with membranes because we have uh, record proxies. That's, that's the idea. Yeah, still trying to connect the dots there. Maybe I, I don't understand well what what the box give you when you when you are in a proto chain. So you create a box which is nothing but an object with a deref method. Is that all it has? Oh yeah. So the idea is that record and tuple literals or constructs that make records and tuples dereference the box as soon as they get it. So they check is each thing that is being given to me either uh, a thing without identity, or if it's a if it's a box, then I'll dereference it on the way in. So that way you don't accidentally point to mutable things. So things are deeply mutable by default, but you have this escape hatch. So after it's constructed, it just is directly pointing to that other object. And equality is defined recursively still. So once you hit something with identity, you're comparing it with by identity. So Can you repeat that sentence again? Uh, like equality is still recursive. So you can have objects with identity that are directly contained in records and tuples. And equality is just to find that if you hit something with identity, then that's compared internally by identity. And But if you're at a record, then you're comparing it by individual value by individual value until you get to something nested that's by identity and then you compare it by that. But the boxes are unboxed on the way in. So the records don't actually contain boxes, they're just used when it's being constructed. Um, can the same value be in more than one box? I, I presume that's the... Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. All right, so it's just less realistic a box, but it's, it's a way to keep a reference and then dereference it. Oh, <laughs> you're right, box is not a very clear word for it. Yeah, so, well, it's a virtual box. It can do more stuff. Sorry, I don't understand the, um, the you, you said that boxes are dereferenced on the way in. What, what is the reason to have the box at all and not just pass in the, you know? Uh, no. uh, the main reason uh, is to have this default deep immutability, um, you know, by default, it only works with immutable things. You have to specifically opt out of deep immutability to, to put an object in. So it's like an opinion rather than an invariant. Right, but, the, but the, 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 the immutability there is like, so you're, the, when you put a box around that object, the only thing that, that you really, uh, my understanding is that the only thing that you are preserving there is that that reference to that object will remain that reference and you cannot change it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Based on the identity of the box. So, but, but it's still the object that you're referencing in that box could change. If I have a reference to it, I could change B to three if I want to. So I think one of the things we should probably kind of come loop back to is that one of the key priorities of record and tuple is that like the default is that deeply immutable is, um, like what happens when you use the feature. So we're really, one of the things we try to avoid is 
a, like accidentally, like the user accidentally slipping a mutable reference into a record in tuple. Like the, we find that this happens really commonly with like user land immutable libraries. So there, there's no technical reason why we couldn't just, if we're detecting boxes, just detect identity like objects and store the reference. Like that seems reasonable from a spec specification perspective, but that just means that you can create records with mutable objects in them and not realize it. So the box forces you to make the choice that you are saying, this is a, this is effectively a pointer to the object and we are opting out of immutability for this part of the tree. Like it's, it's purely, Dan mentioned it perfectly. It's purely like an opinion of our design for the surface of record and tuple. It's not like, it's not something that must be done. It's something we think should be done. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that, that part, I think it is fine. Um, I, I, for me, it's like, okay, well, be, even before talking about boxes, I, I still don't understand what the deal will be for the proxies when these are objects instead of primitive. That's one question that I have. And the second question is about the, I'm getting very confused about the underscore underscore proto. And what does it do? And when you do that line that you were showing before, what exactly is happening there? Because new box returns an identity. That thing is sure is a thing is that has a pointer, but but how do we use that? Like what, what exactly is this giving us? Which question do you want to discuss first? I think the the, the proxy is better because the box we could say there's a secondary feature. Like even without the box, so box the is record. the whole point of this. Box is the whole point, is most of the point is switching to objects. But anyway, I guess we should cover both of them. So uh, record proxies, the, the idea of record proxies is this lets you proxy a record in tuple while making equality still work. So you want it to be that if you proxy a record, uh, with the same membrane twice, then you're still getting the same record back. But you can't put that record as the key of weak map if it were, a, I mean, whether it's a primitive or not. They, they don't have identity, so they can't be keys of weak maps. So instead, so, we, we totally go around that by just saying that uh, you can make a new proxy, new record proxy, and uh, it will have the behavior you want. It won't have any state because the target is, um, you know, when, when the target is a record or, or tuple and the handler is shared and the handler, you're using the same handler again, then um, it, should, it should be considered equal. There's just nothing distinguishable about them. If you- Okay, create, so uh, two clarification questions about that. Um, so I get that proxy record you pass a target, which is the same record when you call it twice. Um, fine, it, it returns a thing that you can compare. But the problem is that in most cases when it comes to membrane, the target that you pass is not really the target, but a shadow target. And the reason why it is a shadow target is because it breaks the invariant of the target that you that you have. So this target is immutable. Um, so if you ask that proxy for a particular value out of that proxy, it should return the same that is in the target because the target is frozen and you can not change that for something else. So in order to keep the object invariance, we have to provide a shadow target on the target. And then the handler is responsible for doing the, 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 the connection between the target and the actual shadow target and, and, and do the proper handling. That's one question. The second question is about the handler itself. I, I, can't, I can't process this if you do multiple questions and I'm supposed to remember the previous questions. Yeah, yeah sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, I forgot about shadow targets. Um, I'm wondering if you need them when proxying records, given that you never mutate records. Well, I suspect that you do because the idea is that you don't see any of the objects of the record. You see proxies of every object off of that record. 
may I, um, to, just to speak further on this, um, I kind of see the point that Carity is making um, about distortions. In particular, let's say we had a, a shadow record, which was hiding one of the fields of the original, um, of the original record. Uh, you're introducing a whole bunch of complications there because if it's, I, I mean, it's a, it's a use case that hasn't been explored, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if, if we're talking about the same mechanism for the proxy that we have today, it seems to me that we need the shadow target. If this is a new kind of proxy and with different handler properties, then we, we could explore that. But Daniel, think about does think about handler, does the does the handler close over the underlying the shadow target? Uh, so the so so f think about this example. You have a two records. One of them use the other one. Like it, the, one record that has a property that points to another record, something like that. When I create a proxy record, I get a proxy out of the original outer record. And when I access the property X, which contains the other record, what does it return? Will it return the, 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 the value out of that target to preserve the object invariant because it's frozen? Or you're going to return a new proxy for that second record? It will have to return a new proxy. That's why you cannot have a target pass to the proxy record. Unless it sounds I, like enforcing invariance was a totally broken idea if you, everybody has to use shadow targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, a, that's a different conversation. Because the yes. invariants were all made for this group of people. Like, why, why were invariants created if, <laughs> if you directly just bypass them? You know, yeah. there's an implementation burden and then... Well, know, I think it's not, it's not really by, by passing them. It's just enforcing them in a different way. But, but that's a separate conversation, I would say. But, but I think you get the idea. Like, okay, well, you still need to go through a hoop in a no, in, no, with I this shadow target. Yeah. Uh, do does the handler close over the shadow target, or how is the shadow target linked to the? So the shadow target is what you pass as the first argument to the proxy record, and the handler close over the target. Okay, so this would be this would be completely unusable for that idiom because the handler. I'm assuming that you can reuse the handler. So yeah, that and that that was only my so, first part of the question. The second okay. part is like. The handler today is mutable. You can change the, 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 the behavior of the handler at any given time by even changing the entire traps, which is a problem for some people, a feature for some other people that so we need to be careful about that one too. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, I was thinking that we could do it by comparing the handler. So if we reuse the handler, then it's the same identity. Uh, and the, and the proxy record would be equal, but none of this works with the shadow target issue that you mentioned yep. with the proxy invariance. So uh, I don't know. It doesn't but sound doesn't, like invariants were a good the, idea. But I'm not sure which invariance you're talking about, but I mean, doesn't this give you control over the equality between two proxy records? Um, because if you choose to use the same target, you will have the same uh, apparent identity. Uh, and if you choose to use a different target, it'll it'll give you a different identity. And so that gives the membrane a chance to decide whether or not these two objects or whether these two uh, wrapped objects should compare equal or not uh, and complete control over that. I don't, so uh, it, they're only considered equal if the handlers are equal. So if you, and I think that's important, if you had the same target. Oh, it's comparing. Then no, but we will oh, have different okay. behavior and it wouldn't make sense for them to be equal. Okay, so okay, so it's not about the target. It's a, it's not about the shadow target. It's about the handlers being uh, yeah, distinct. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's so, two, so what is two the use them, case? Two of them. Because if you don't have a shadow target, then you cannot really implement a membrane or, around these records. Y yeah, so I just need yeah. to go back and think about this because I just wasn't looking at the proxy invariant enforcement. But I think it doesn't work. It's broken. Carity's right. If, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, I mean the current way of of creating these shadow targets uh, is that you create a single shadow target that is shared between 
all objects of the same uh, type, if I can say. So you have a function shadow target on, or at least this is no, the way I've done no, it. No, 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 that's, um, no, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Okay, because okay so there's the, a depending, distinct depending shadow on the target, target for each. Yeah, yeah. Okay. one to one mapping. each object. Yeah, because you, if the target, if the target has a non-configurable, non-writable descriptor on it, and you access it through the handler, you will have to install that into the shadow target because otherwise you will break the invariant. So when you return the value from the handler, it must be installed on the shadow target. Otherwise, the invariant well, will break. Well, we don't have to worry about anything. that for this case because uh, they're not, uh, you know, because they're sealed. But right, I can they're, they're, they are all proxy the records. For just fact, for just to give an idea, I can imagine proxy records having a third parameter. They have the shadow target, the handler, and like the real target that gets passed as an extra parameter to all the proxy methods. And then that might that might solve this proxy this invariance issue. There but, are thirteen traps on uh, proxy handlers right now. Um, none of them get a real target. They get the target that was passed in as the first argument to the proxy create call. Sorry, I don't mean real target. I mean, we could call it a payload. Like they would all get an extra payload instead of the handler having to close over it because it's not able to close over yeah, it. Yeah, we call it identity payload or something. Yeah, there's some, yeah. some of that. <laughs> Can we, um, I, I, I'm still not convinced that, that it is actually a problem. I think it may just require a different pattern on the, on the membrane implementation, um, is, is that uh, is that statement true, or is it um, is it that it breaks the is it that it breaks the current pattern of implementation, or is that that we it makes something impossible that you, was previously are, possible? Are, are, are you saying that, that shadow tag is not needed? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, I, I think shadow targets can be used, um, but I don't see the invariance that it breaks. Um, but I don't fully understand the 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 way it's being used uh, in your uh, in your situation, Crudy. Um, my the the membranes that I've got in microbium are probably a little bit more um, primitive, uh, or you know, more simple. So maybe maybe I'm not facing the same problems you are. Uh, but would it be possible for you to um, to kind of write up the the requirements more specifically so I could understand? Yeah, them? no, it, it's it's, a, it's the, the the example that I was saying before. You have record food that contains a property X that contains a record bar. Yeah. So you just have two records, and because yeah. the record everything is sealed, yeah. so it's everything is not configurable, not writable at that point. You try to put a proxy around foo, which is a record, and that returns a, 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 pro, a, a proxy of it. Uh, and now in that proxy, you try to access the X out of it. Right. You, uh, so if you don't use a shadow target, that accessor to X must return the same value that the original record foo has for the accessor X. Otherwise so, you're breaking the, the, the object invariant. It must be the same. So the only way that you can return a proxy around that second record is by putting a shadow target whose value for X is a new proxy for the second record. Okay, so I wanna suggest for a solution, we could take a third argument to proxy.record, and if you pass that third argument, it's used as the this value for the proxy traps instead of the handler being used as the this value. Uh, would that? Yeah, we, we can explore that for sure. Mm -hmm. Then the second set of problems is really about the handler. What are we going to do with the handler? Uh, and I suspect it, one way of looking at this is saying, well, for proxy record, the handler is not a live object is a configuration option. Uh, um, sure, we could do that, but that seems kind of uh, either either way would, would kind of work. Because either way, the handler methods have identity, and that, that identity is going to be observable. And right, but, but, but remember that today, 
the identity of the traps are not uh, used unless that you hit the trap. So when you hit the trap, it gets the handler for the trap. I would recommend adding a section to this document if, if you're going to propose this that specifies how to alter existing traps. Again, there's 13 of them. And to specify uh, what new traps you may need and which ones would be callable in which cases. For instance, uh, the apply and, and construct traps don't apply for anything except functions. So I think I didn't explain very well, but this box concept would let you make a callable uh, record proxy because you'd be able to put a box around a function and then pass that in as the target. You, you mean pass the, the, the box or? The, the box of the function. Box. So I think, I think we could give you the full generality of proxies. We could make it a configuration object. I don't see any problem with that. And we could say that you pass in a separate this value that then people can use for the, the target and you know solving the the problem of having to close over the the thing in the handler and then i think we would just have all the traps with all the same signatures so i, I got confused about the last thing that you said that this value in the in, in the trap is already handled right so because the handle is live handler, so we would say the handler is now a configuration object the handler is has its methods read and then it's discarded. And yeah. the value passed into the handler would instead of being the handler would be the third argument to proxy.record. I got it, got it, got it. Yeah. Yeah, so this is very helpful. I hadn't thought that kind of stuff through at all. <laughs> and uh, but I want to I want to come back to sort of the main point about like even though these are objects, they don't have identity and we suddenly have box working, which we previously concluded in an earlier meeting with this group was a total non-starter. Um, so, so Daniel, before getting into the box, just to confirm, the, when you have a record, the underscore underscore prod of the record is what, no? Uh, that's a separate question that we could debate. So for a normal record that doesn't have underscore underscore proto, there's, um, in the current spec, it's null, but then there's a PR open that would make it a record prototype that would have, um, you know, certain properties. Um, I was initially thinking that it was really, really important that records, is Bradley here? Um, yes. Oh, great. So Bradley and I were chatting about the importance of you know, records are addressed by keys, by, by string keys, and you wouldn't really want uh, weird object stuff to get in the way of the domain of string keys. Um, but if this is gonna be a general object thing, maybe we still do want prototype access because then it would be really cool. You could use it for classes. I don't know. Um, that's, a, that's a vague idea, but... Um, maybe records should just be objects, but not have the object stuff in their prototype chain. And maybe they should just defer for string things and allow their prototype to be objects or, or records. But that the identity, it, if it's a record is compared by comparing the entries. So I'm more, more con concerned about uh, about one of these things, what would the, the, pro, the pro underscore underscore proto be a, an object rather than another record or no? Uh, so it's allowed to be any of them. If you pass in, if you do an explicit underscore underscore proto, it could be an object, it could be a record, which is a kind of object or, mm -hmm. but I mean, if it's an object, you have to put it in a box or it could be null. All three would be permitted. So it's not a, a regular object. It must be a record or a box. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, just as part of the you know deep immutability by default. But if you pass a box, then it would get unboxed when it's being constructed. Okay. 
and let me, let me think more about that. I'll get some feedback on that. Um, I've been thinking for so long that records and tuples have to be primitives because we really want this definition of equality. But now I'm thinking if we do proxies and boxes right, then we could just have these be objects that have this definition of equality. So what's distinguishing is that they don't have identity and that equality is defined that way, not that they're primitives. And oh, I thought, oh, so, you know, there was something that I uh, really appreciated when I first saw records in tuples. Uh, that for me, I was just seeing it as a way to get like two uh, two comparisons, uh, as something like that would lead to similarities with deep equal from testing frameworks, um, and that was one one of the things that got me really excited. I am not sure how this solution, because it's hard to see it uh, just yet um how transforming into objects will still preserve that and that's like for me uh personally it's something that i really value like the the same value zero or uh being able to go through records and tuples in uh a nested uh comparison uh yep that's the Comparisons idea that it would it. maintain that definition for equality i agree that that's sort of the core value or one of the core values but yeah we would just continue to define equality like that. Maybe there's a problem. I, also, I just don't know what it is. I, I also would it help if we like that. made this slight, sorry, Leo, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Would it help if we yeah. made this slightly more concrete and like described a way, bitch, a way by which you could describe this in the spec and then go from there to describe how like the same value functions would work? Because the way this is works in my head is just like, if, if you'll indulge me in a quick like brainstorm, an identityless object would just have, like let, imagine for, this is not a recommendation for how this would be done, but imagine for example, that identityless objects just have an internal slot called identityless set to true or something. And the same value non-numeric would just check if that, if, an, if it's an object of that type or with that internal slot and then do a recursive deep equality check on its properties if that flag exists. That's, and that's what we already do for records. We would just change it to object with identityless internal slot instead of a record primitive. So like we would still keep, so the surface level equality comparisons would be exactly the same. I see Bradley has his hand up. What does that mean? Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'm listening to this uh, changes. There is a lot to take in. Um, it seems like we would get box and we wouldn't need to use primitive with these changes, but it seems like the proposal alters mm. its scope to be much less in some ways. Uh, you're not trying to guarantee uh, deep immutability. You're not trying to have the integrity be consistent uh, for string keys. And I'm just kind of wondering, uh, we had an old proposal uh, that got scrapped called composite key. Um, this seems to me like we are effectively doing a API proposal that's similar in scope to what composite key was at the time. And I'm, just kind of curious about all this uh, complexity that we're adding versus just the statement that we want an equality operator that is not based upon object identity. Um, if, if that's the case, should we be looking at something else rather than trying to make an entire new class of value? I, um, I think that's the main thing that's well, preserved, actually, given all these changes. Can you say more about the history of composite key? Like, why was it scrapped? Uh, people did not like that composite key generated a new value. Um, it, it was not something like records or tuples. It 
didn't try, well, the previous records or Tuple's current, whatever you want to call it, it did not try to do more than produce an identity given a set of component parts. And people thought that that was not valuable, but that it seems to be the key uh, sale on this altered proposal here. Uh, so, I mean, I think the benefits for normal programming of records and tuples would still be there. The, I want to I want to say that the the idea of weakening the string prototype invariance that's totally separable from the rest of this. We could still, I think that's totally separable from the idea of box and proxies. We could. Uh, I'd agree. I think the. What I'm trying to state is you, there is so much that's been weakened. I think the only thing that's still preserved against the original, uh, I wouldn't call them goals, but the uh, cell of records and tuples is that given component parts, they have equality. Well, but there's also the deep immutability opinion. Even if it's not an invariant, uh, it still could it still could help programming in practice that you have to put a box. Um, the other thing is having literal syntax for for frozen for for this frozen thing. You know. So, the, just going on about the deep immutability, one of the statements was it's easy for you for your users to inject mutable state into. Uh, read-only collections and things like that in existing libraries. What's to prevent people from injecting a box into something where people did not want mutable state within a value? The fact that you have to manually type the box. But like, you might not control that code. You could be the library. Oh, like a library you consume returns a box? You're just using a variable. I mean, you you Maybe. get a parameter and you just Maybe shove it in your record. Hmm. Maybe we want different literal syntax for it that can only be used together in the record literal. But I'm I'm unclear. I just I'm I'm, not, I'm also uh, not clear what we're protecting against. It's hard for me to picture this as like a threat model. Uh, this is not, I think going so far as to call it a threat model isn't the direction here. We aren't saying that this is a security uh, feature, this proposal. Um, the complaint that we heard earlier in this call was people got problems from mutable references being placed in immutable collections. And it still seems possible to do so I would fairly easily. That the problem isn't people putting mutable objects in records. It's the problem of people putting mutable objects in records and not knowing that it's happening. Like the, I, I totally understand the problem around like someone else giving you a box. I think that makes sense. I think maybe literal syntax will help there, but I don't think the invariant that we're pushing for is that you can never put mutable data in, in a, like people want, really do want that. Like that's what we heard from the committee is people do I'm, want to put mutable things in a record. I am not opposed to that. I think it is just still easy for somebody who sees an error or uh, accidentally gives you a variable that's a box uh, to still put stuff in there that's mutable. There's no place where the record is being constructed to state this should not be mutable. Hmm. That's a really good May, one. So I don't, uh, so I don't fully understand. Uh, uh, and, uh, I don't fully understand any version of the proposal. So I'm going to ask a dumb question. And I apologize ahead of time. Um, the how does how does this alteration of the record and tuple proposal interact with uh, keys in maps? Not weak maps, but maps. Because uh, my current understanding of the shape of the language is that there, are the there are two kinds of values that can be keys and maps, and they're value types and and object types, and uh, and the treatment for them is, uh, with the 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 proper the property of both of these 
that's in, they're the, that's important is not just equality but hashability, um, a consistent hashability. Um, does having a box with mutable state somewhere in the transit in, inside of a uh, of a record or tuple object graph alter the hashability of the root of that graph? I think primitive versus object doesn't affect the hashability. Both are both are hashable. So from an implementation perspective, objects that are hashed would have to be assigned an identity hash code at some point. And I don't see why that identity hash code couldn't work its way up to be, you know, hashed into a composite hash code for the, the record. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so so with the, does it remain true? Does it remain true then that there, that there's a, there's, there's this strong relationship between a, the consistent hash and equivalence um, that any two values that are equal will have the same hash. Yes. Okay. Oh, like, a, like for comparison on the equality side, if you create two records and they each have a property with a box and that box both points to the same record, when you do the recursive comparison on the record, um, it will, they will both reach the object and they're the same object. So they have the same identity, so they're equal. Oh, does that mean that you have to do a recursive hash um, every, time, uh, every time you place one of these into a, into a key? Because that is not the case with an immutable data structure. You could cache the hashes. I think that's true whether this is a primitive or an object. Mm -hmm. Well, well with, if, if it's an object, it's, it's, it's constant time hash because you're just, it, it's just the identity of the object is the hash. Well, the, but not these objects. But these objects, it's, a, it's a computed, right? Um, and is it cacheable or does it get invalidated if some state changes somewhere in its transitive graph? It wouldn't be invalidated because anything that could change would have an identity and we would be looking at its identity as our part of our hash component rather than its current value. It's identity and the identity is not replaceable. Yeah. Mutable parts of this by value. We're not comparing anything mutable by value. Mutable I things see. compared by identity. I think I understand. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and to, to, to restate my understanding, um, it's that the identity, uh, it, that they, they remain transitively immutable because you cannot replace, uh, you cannot, you cannot replace uh, an object with, with, with an with a object with a different identity in, in the graph. That sounds right. Okay. Are there any other questions or Dan, is there another section you want to cover or? We could talk more about this, this last part of record classes. Uh, people, but people really don't have any any more questions or, or concerns. I feel like I want to follow up and understand better the stuff Bradley was talking about because I don't think I don't think we have a complete answer to that. Um, I'm just stating uh, basically, if you were to change from box in your example with proto to a variable a, b, c, d, who who knows. Um, there's nothing really that uh, has the default behavior be uh, towards deep immutability. Um, you, other languages have keywords like mut to know that something could be mutable. Um, so if for any given property in your record literal, um, if you use a variable and you don't check that it is deeply immutable for whatever definition you want for that, um, you're no longer guaranteed to have deep immutability.
by default, you have to actually perform that check to uh, state that you are deeply immutable. So uh, I'm wondering when are the cases that you want to assert deep immutability so that we could figure out what kind of solutions would, would work? Uh, I could probably concoct some. Uh, I know we do this for things like the policy mechanism in Node. Uh, generally, they're just things that we don't want to see mutated uh, because we will cache values regarding them. Um, and so we will compute uh, values based upon nested structures. Um, we recently have decided to stop doing a bunch of complex stuff and just ship composite key inside node. Um, so we're going to do that soon because we have multiple objects and we are computing stuff around them and we keep them around for various reasons, but we want to be sure that they never change. Something that might help that just came to mind, and I don't know if this is just a random idea, but if the boxes weren't unwrapped by default, then when you access a, uh, when you access a property on a record, um, if you, if the, if the consumer side is expecting it to be mute, is expecting it to be mutable, you can expect a box in that position and then dereference the box explicitly. Um, it would it would mean that the contract between the producer and the consumer of the record, uh, the, the 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 boxing is part of that contract. Um, so so then you can assume essentially that something is deeply immutable unless it contains a box, uh, but you know that it contains a box because you have to unwrap the box explicitly. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, I understand that. Uh, they've got a lot of that going on in Rust with dot .unwrap. Um, I don't think we actually need to go that far. We just need a way to either uh, test if something is deeply immutable or have a way when you insert something for it to eagerly fail if it is mutable. So what, what if we called all deep, all, uh, things without identity, objects with ident without identity records. We said tuples are a type of record and record dot is record became a shallow immutability test. It wouldn't, it wouldn't fail if the record then contains a box, but it would fail if, you know, if you ask it about an object. So it would kind of correspond to composite key, how composite key does contain these, uh, Maybe this is the wrong default because you have to actually call this function, but is this the test that we want for a mute keyword? Do we want to be testing is record shallowly or do we want to really be doing a deep recursive test? That's something I don't understand. Uh, I think we could discuss that. Um, in my experience, I've done deep tests. Um, maybe shallow is fine. I mean, since you're already talking about a box, if you can just shallow and the only things at the next level are boxes would be fine. So, I think. so it, it, it strikes me that um, if the box is explicit, there's nothing preventing you from having a, uh, a completely immutable data object which is used as a key into a separate table of mutable objects. Um, and this is basically just a shorthand for that. So I don't, I don't know that uh, adding a, a deep immutability uh, uh, add-on to this buys any additional functionality. I'd agree. We just need to check that during that shallow check, uh, even if they are uh, frozen keys, the properties are either, uh, are all non-identity based, I should say. So, so a box would be allowed. When I said shallow check, I really meant, is this thing that I'm checking a record? I didn't mean check each thing in the record. Um, that would be like one. Well, I mean, you could just do a type of check. Yeah. That. With this That's idea, not... type of would still be object. But then I was saying, instead of a type of check, you do a record dot is record check. 
I think we'd still need to check that all the values for its keys are non-identity. Well, if you've constructed one, then it must, like if you, if we're imagining these records as special kinds of objects, if you have managed to construct one, then it cannot have mutable properties, like other than boxes. So. I thought boxes were unwrapped automatically. Well, but That's you can't what I was mute. Very confused as well. Like, uh, but you, you can't mutate that that reference itself. If you have a record with property X and property X has a value of a box, you if it's unwrapped, then that X points to that object, but you can't change X itself. So the record right, itself can, is shallowly mutable. But you can change the bits of it, and by changing a, a property out of the object that you have in the box you're effectively changing the the outcome that you would normally have if you ask a record for a particular property which is supposed to be immutable so if i ask the record for the property x it returns something every time that i access it because this prototype is an object that has an x that is inside a box because it's unwrapped during the creation now I can change that X to anything every time that you access and get a getter on that X or whatever. Yeah, and this is a feature request that we keep getting. We keep getting people requesting the feature that you would be able to do exactly this. But um, then that, that, that introduces so much of a problem for, for the record proposal because if everything else is... I, I, I always thought that if you have something in a record that is a box, you must know that it's a box and you must dereference that. But it has no implication whatsoever on the record itself. Okay. Uh, that was my assumption up to this point. But now, because of this underscore underscore process, that's why I was getting very confused. I see. So let, why don't we say that uh, boxes don't get automatically dereferenced when you put them into a record in tuple. So that would be kind of too cute too much allowing you to forget that there's actually a mutable thing. It would create this hazard where you would create these mutable data structures. By requiring the explicit DREF on access, then we reduce that hazard and make it explicit when you're accessing these mutable data structures. So you don't get right. something secretly. Would that be right. I, I get that. I get that, but it changes the properties of the record. Like now the record is not something that every time that I ask for it, a, a, a property out of the record, it will always have the same value. And that changes now. Uh, how does that change? I don't think that changes. So if I create a record whose prototype is a box, and that, that box contains an object who has an X equal one there, and I keep a reference to that object somewhere else, and I change that, X to two, three, four, and so on. The record that was created whose prototype, the score and the score proto points to that X because it's the reference during the, the creation. That's what I'm understanding from this. Then if I access the record dot X, I'm going to get the X from the proto chain and that X is mutable. Uh, right. So what if we said like, actually let's not do this proto thing. As I wrote here, this section is not very well thought through. The sections that I, the, the reason that I was thinking about this is I was thinking about how could we make it so that uh, the temporal proposal actually consists of records, but um, you point out real problems. So uh, let's just focus on these, I mean. So yeah, to be clear, I do think you can do automatic unboxing. It's just gonna take some conversation about the actual uh, things needed in the case of such a thing being allowed. I think it could even be done afterward, um, if that matters, Daniel. What do you mean by afterward? So if it's an error um, by default uh, to insert something that is not a box and boxes are not automatically unwrapped, we could have a mechanism that does unwrap when you create a record. Um, you mean like similar to how you could await a non-thinnable or thinnable 
it would just work on whatever the operand is and unwrap it appropriately. Uh, but what do you think about that issue that Garrity raised about Proto's sort of totally destroying mutability property? I think you shouldn't allow underscore underscore Proto in these. The special form for under under Proto um, is useful, but I don't I think know I, I, it is I think useful it for records or tuples. It, I think uh, it's useful if you want to compose, use the same capabilities that you have in object to compose records. I think that's useful in the sense that you can have a record that extends from another record and because they are immutable and that the chain mutable, it, it's, it's something nice. So you have to uh, imagine that rather than creating a copy, rather than creating a copy of the, oh, sorry. Maybe I should clarify. Uh, I don't think a proto of a non-record is uh, okay. Got it. same. Got it. Yeah. But to be clear, I, I what I'm really interested in is that you could have a record class that could have methods. And so I'm trying to think about how that would possibly work. We could say that the prototype of that is immutable or frozen or something. Or we could, you know, we would, would want to have, you know, tuples do have a prototype. Tuples need to have methods. It needs to be possible to polyfill other methods onto tuple prototype. So it's not a frozen class. And uh, I was hoping that we could have some notion of classes for records. And one, one big problem for classes for records is that the constructor system in JavaScript doesn't make any sense on, on records because you have to incrementally write into the thing. So I was thinking we could have a new kind of constructor syntax, which is from a static method, you could do this new dot instance thing. It would create a new instance that has of the enclosing class that would have the, the fields filled in with an object literal. And maybe this would make sense for typed objects as well, because you can't, you just can't incrementally initialize them. And then this thing would have to have, this really would have to have a, a dunder proto somewhere to be able to reference its methods. Is, is that the main use case here is to be able to add methods to a record? I mean, the methods can already exist. You could just have the, but, but to have the methods shared between multiple instances um, of a particular type of record. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the reason that I put this Dunder Proto in a record, because I wanted to be able to share methods between records. For example, tuples do this. Tuples don't have identity, but they share methods between them. And that's, that's part of the current proposal. So this would kind of generalize that. Uh, any thoughts, any ideas about how to make record classes work? Maybe it's not possible. I think records are still worth it even if we don't have record classes, but yeah. I, you know, I, uh, we're, we're, so it, it, to clarify, we, we don't consider record classes or records with protos to be feasible because you could, in this, in this example, um, because you can make them you could give a record in a, a mutable prototype, right? Is, is that, am I understanding the room correctly? Uh, essentially, from my perspective, yes. But we still want to be able to, but like ideally, like, and so one solution to that is to just make prototypes only records or like a record prototype can only be a record, which would solve that problem, but it would cause another problem in that you cannot have methods because records themselves cannot have methods. So what if we said that object prototypes were frozen 
there must be frozen. That would similarly solve the problem. I guess it wouldn't because the properties of then that object don't have to be frozen. Never mind. Um, so I'm okay with that still. I just want to be sure that it whatever one level deep is non identity. I think I having things be uh, a test rather than an enforced invariant is fine where we could just call a method like is shallow leave non-identified. I don't know what to call it. It's a terrible name. That just checks all the current key value pairs on the object to make sure that at one level deep they are uh, non-identity. They could have however much and it just returns a boolean true or false would solve my checks for usages i don't actually need it to not be mutable i just needed a quick way to check that something appears to not have mutable state at the level i'm operating on okay so that would i'm i apologize for asking you to repeat yourself but i want a little bit more clarification so if this check, it will return true or false when that thing you're checking has a box as a value. So it would... Uh, it would return true because a box is a non-identity according to what has been stated. Okay. It is still considered uh, immutable for that level. Right. So then, so then checking, so then if you make the invariant, if you, if you assert the invariant that a record can only contain non-identifiable things, so primitives and non-objects without identity, then that check simply becomes a check that it, that it is a record. Because if records are the only thing that have that invariant, then the fact that it is a record means that that is true. Like you don't have to check the values, I guess is my point. I have, really? a, I have a thought and it's not well formed yet. Um, well, neither are any of mine, it's okay. I'm just, I'm just thinking this uh, whole concept of records and having inherited properties. Um, it sounds like you may be wanting to specify that equality of records only depends on the own keys of a record. That it may not want to depend on the prototype chain at all. Well, I think question. you would, I think you would define it by the equality of the prototype. So, if the prototype is an object, then it's defined by that. If the prototype is a is a record, then it would be defined by the by the deep equality of that that record, right? So, if it's an object, it's still by identity. That's not what I'm getting at. Um, what I'm getting at is strictly talking about records and the equality of records. Um, do we count the prototype chain as part of that equality check is what I'm asking. I think you need to because in order for you to create a record, um, because the, the, the proto chain is immutable, by comparing the object, you know for sure if it is the object that you want, that, 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 you're, that you have in the first place. Yeah, it's, it's important that if you have two different records and they're the same except for their prototype, then, uh, you know, they're going to behave differently because when you get the prototype, you'll get a different thing. So they shouldn't be equal, right? Yeah, exactly. So you don't have to do anything. It's just triple equal on the object itself. But I thought, Daniel, that there was another property of the records that was like, if I create two identical records and I compare them, uh, are they going to be uh, in, the, in the previous proposal, was then supposed to be equal or just not equal? Uh, they're supposed to be equal. That's a key property but of the proposal and the idea it, we would we would stick with that. But in this case, in this case, it's not possible to do that. Like if I declare two two uh, records, they point to the different object. Uh, the idea would be that that's not observable. Oh, 
identity. Oh, I see, I see. Because it doesn't have identity. I, I got it, I got it, I got it. I don't know if still that's... still faulty about how you eliminate the identity of that, but... but. Yeah, like, I, I, I... Vim, quote, not having an identity, I think maybe the wrong verbiage here, because objects and their identity are kind of intertwined in JavaScript, and I think that's maybe confusing some people. What I would say, maybe instead, Dan, if I'm going to suggest wording, is like hidden identity in that every operation that can observe the identity, we make it so that you can't observe it. But like, so whether or not they have an identity is kind of a moot point because you couldn't tell anyway. So like the goal here is to make objects behave observably like the primitive version of record in all cases. So then you can't tell the difference. But like the idea is that we're hiding identity in all cases. A third way to talk about it that our coworker Robin uses is that they're interned. As if whenever you create a record, it looks in the global table and gives you the original one if somebody else made a record with the same contents. Yes, and, and interning is definitely the term of art. I like the concept of the secret identity though. <laughs> Maybe we should just document all three of these ways of looking at it since it's so hard to think about and different people like different ways. Can I throw in another, another option, which is to consider it as value identity. So it's not that their identity is not there, but that their identity is established on the value that they contain rather than the sort of reference identity or the identity of the address of the object. Oh, that's, that's an interesting way. It reminds me of, I think Jordan Harban talked about unique identity versus non-unique identity that values would have. Maybe it's similar. Right. And yeah, insofar as like numbers have identity, it's just forgeable, I guess. Sure. Um. For, for the lack of anything better to say, I have some superficial ideas. Um, one of them is that I think that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that DREF could be pronounced value of in a way that's consistent with the existing value ofs of other box types. Oh, okay. I don't even know what value of means. It means so many different things. <laughs> yeah, well, for well, box types, uh, box type, uh, constructing a box type and calling value of returns the intern, uh, the contained value. For arrays it, and objects and stuff, it just returns the uh, instance. It doesn't do anything like convert it to a number. Yeah, I think that those two properties are consistent. If it's an object, it returns itself, and if it's a non, if it's a if it's a box type, it returns the contained value. Um, uh, the other superficial idea is that if you work, so for one, I really, I, I, I kind of find compelling the idea that if you put a box inside of a record or a tuple, um, it sort of escapes the zone of transitive immutability and sort of just ends uh, it, it creates a boundary between the portion that's used for tracking the identity of the resulting object graph and the part that's that is free to change. Um, what I what I th I think that it's it's compelling because that's going to exist in um, for the prototype reference at least um, regardless. So it's it's very clever in that way. Um, uh, superficially, um, I instead of new dot instance, uh, you might consider hash, uh, hash constructor name with curly braces after it. So several um, people have suggested that that's actually a really good yeah. point. Like, but unrelated to this, it's come up in GitHub a lot. Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard because you would kind of want to have an arbitrary expression there, but now we're putting hash in a bunch of places and it's, it also, it also kind of conflicts with some stuff that we might want to do with private names. Uh, oh yeah, grammatically it might collide. Mm -hmm. Actually, this idea would work really well with this other possible syntax that we had for records and tuples, at least for records it would work, where we would have like a bar on the inside and then you could put the name before the bar. I guess that wouldn't work for tuples though. 
I mean, yeah, that, that would invoke uh, Ruby PTSD for me, but. <laughs> uh, or not PTSD, an allergy, a Ruby allergy. I would sneeze. Oh, but is it for, for blocks in Ruby? It would. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's funny. Well, so what do people think overall? Is this a direction that we should pursue of using objects rather than primitives, or do primitives seem better? Seems I, like a promising I, avenue of exploration to me. Um, the use case of, is, sorry, go ahead, I'm gonna just raise hand, just get it there eventually. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, thanks. Um, I've used the uh, immutable JS library extensively in some of my projects, and I find that there's always reason, or often uh, in every scenario I've encountered, there's there's reason to include uh, include some kind of reference to immutable objects uh, somewhere in a, in a large immutable graph. So I'm in favor of of this kind of approach that makes it a little bit easier to do that. Um, then you can sort of choose whether you want to, whether you want to have the comparison uh, on the, the object identity or the value identity for each property individually. So I like the direction this is going if it can work out. I guess I'm up. Um, so I think this is much simpler overall for my brain than primitives. I think it's very new and there's going to be more discussion if you go down this route. But I do think it would be easier to deal with box if that is the goal here. Um, I think establishing that boundary of what is uh, or how to test for if something is immutable will need to be reclaimed somehow, either by not auto unboxing or supplying an API to do a shallow test. Um, but I don't think those are in any way bad. Um, those are perfectly fine from my perspective. That's all. Well, the time is. I don't have. I don't have an opinion. Yeah, the time is two forty-three. Uh, so we have time if there's further avenues for discussion. Um, they're vaguely related to this uh, group, but Node's doing a bunch of policy work uh, recently prepping for some upcoming stuff um, regarding what has been done for redirects. We are going to be introducing a scoping mechanism. Um, so instead of uh, doing what we historically have, which is per source text, uh, providing a way to do redirects, we'll be doing that in a hierarchical hierarchy scheme. Um, so that's just something uh, to keep in mind. Also, we have, I've started a closer review of the impact of uh, module cache and import assertions. Um, there are host restrictions being desired by uh, people at TC39. I don't know if anybody here had the explicit opinion that a import assertion should not be allowed to be part of a cache key outside of web browsers. But uh, I am going to be arguing that Node will be using them as cache keys since it seems the browsers are going to be doing so. It seems like an inevitable. Seeing <laughs> it as part of the cache key prohibits you from doing that JSON op optional thing. I don't know why you would do that if you want to allow 
uh, the cache key can still point to the same resource. That is not true on the web, but that has always been true for Node. Oh, so it would, oh, okay. We work off the response URL, otherwise we'd break NPM. Uh, the web works off request URL. So a variety of things like if you were to import unpackage slash lodash, um, you would get the request, not the response. So you can actually get like different contents from requesting the same thing on the web because it's based off request URL, not response. And since we do real pathing always to avoid path traversal, um, we just don't have that. Okay, I'm glad that works out. I was I was pretty worried about that particular thing. So, okay. Uh, no, this is an allowance, uh, not a guarantee. Um, but leading into that, we will be adding um, to the redirects uh, probably something to deal with uh, negotiation if the web adds it. So uh, there is a comment that the web doesn't want to add content negotiation to uh, the type assertion, but that doesn't mean it'll be true for everything in the future. But if it is supported, we have to figure out how we're going to integrate it. And uh, that's going to be rough. So yeah. Doesn't sound like there's too much vying for wanting to limit us using components as part of cache key. So I mean, I will not, take to be clear, I don't I don't really like that design. I, I wish the web and node would both not treat import assertions as part of the cache key. But uh, it sounds that like was my desire too. But, uh, but it sounds like matching. you have worked out in practice and like the web has things worked out in practice. I think Dominic just hasn't given a good argument for why it should be part of the cache key. Uh, you know, we presented an alternative design with spec text that would just work without it being part of the cache key. And yeah, I think it's just weird. There are open issues on what WG trying to ask why various decisions were made that are four or five years old and still no response. I don't think a uh, reason is required. It is just what the web has desired to go forward with. Yep. Uh, seems like that, but it also seems like the impact in real life in both cases will not be so bad, right? That's sort of my calculation for letting this slide. Uh, it's going to be a lot of convincing Jordan. Oh, I already spent a lot of time convincing Jordan about other things. I don't feel like talking to him about this. <laughs> Sorry. I yeah. I think you might miss the goal of next meeting uh, asking for stage three. Really? Um, I mean, Jordan might change his mind, but... Is it, uh, he can't keep he, doing this. Do you, he, we've, we've been through so much with him just for this particular feature. Um, he's stating that he wants uh, various guarantees. Um, he does have a good point that it is easier to change uh, a file on disk in Node than it is to use a service worker to change something on the web uh, to essentially swap out the body underneath you um, for long running uh, stuff. What does that have to do with any of this stuff? Is this all about the weakening of the invariant that Dominic required? Uh, it is about Jordan's demand that the weakened invariant is not allowed outside the web. Let's just not allow it outside the web. Come on, oh, let's talk about this offline, but I think that's a reasonable compromise. I don't uh, think we can talk about it sometime. You can schedule an issue, but I do not think it is viable to not match the web. So. Okay. I do like the idea of matching the web. I just think 
the web doesn't need this either. And it's a, like a weird implementation detail that we could ignore that is only okay because it's not really being used. I do not believe that's true considering we're looking at shipping an HTTPS scheme. No, I, I just mean more concretely that um, we're only including it as part of the cache key on the web because there's only one uh, working value because you're never gonna have multiple cache entries for the same resource unless it's this use case. That's sort of why I'm okay with this because the same the same rationale should apply for the web. Like the web also shouldn't have multiple uh, cache entries for the same uh, for the same um, specifier, just with different uh, just with different assertions. That would be that would be broken either way. I believe that's what the loosened invariant allows. Well, uh, you know, in plenary. But uh, in practice, it shouldn't have that, except in weird edge cases. That's sort of why it's okay, I thought. Um, it is not a weird edge case, as people are doing very strange things to do cache busting in ESM, and it would be much less disgusting. I can talk people this People are going to try to do this with assertions on purpose. I 100% guarantee you they will use this feature. It is that, that's a feature relevant to them. for the HTML thread because I think we were assuming that this wouldn't happen unless there was a poorly behaved server like by accident. Uh no. Yeah, if you could if you could provide context for that, I think that could be helpful. Um I will talk about it. I know people are jumping in the module working group saying it's not designed for that, but that does not influence how it is used. Uh, yeah, that seems like a real issue. Well, the web can always return to the other proposal that we've made, which handles the caching properly without it being part of the, without it being part of the key. Anyway, I will try to get to that issue tomorrow. Okay, that's um, it for me. Yeah, speaking of modules, I suppose that I should give a little bit of an update on the work on CESS. Um, uh, so uh, I have pull requests out that add support for um, third-party modules in the, in the compartment API um, by introducing a, a static module record interface. Um, and that interface implements, uh, it has an imports array and an execute function or method. And the execute method in turn takes an, uh, uh, an, in, uh, an exports namespace object that can be written to um, and uh, the compartment itself and then the resolved imports um, from, uh, from the resolve hook. And uh, it seems to be working. Um, it uh, allows us to have common JS participate by um, writing a common JS static module record that does a heuristic static analysis like most build tooling um, and uh, and JSON, of course. So uh, making some progress over there. Um, send me a, a poke if you'd like to take a look at pull requests. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to stop recording.